welcome you all here and tell you that we are greatly pleased to be able to bring to the campus today uh, one of America's leading reporters, a man whose stories I have been reading for more years than I uh, wish to admit to, uh, uh, Glenn Clark Kessler of the you know, Washington Post. Glenn is here because tonight he's giving a talk over at the LBJ School on his book. Ask me, please. Uh, uh, the Confidant, the Congolese Rights and the Creation of the Bush Legacy. Uh, it is an excellent book. I highly recommend it to everybody. It is available on Amazon.com as well as in all the local bookstores. Uh, anyway, uh, Glenn, as I mentioned, is a correspondent for the Washington Post, a, a mag, a newspaper that people in Washington, D.C. and many other places read religiously. He is a graduate of Brown University, I believe also Columbia. SIFA to its uh, uh, alumni uh, and uh, another institution uh, like uh, the LBJ School. And I think what we agreed was that Glenn is going to sort of talk a little bit, make a few remarks about life as a journalist. And again, he's quite an accomplished one, having uh, shared in two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, which is quite an accomplishment. And then we're going to have a conversation. You can ask uh, any questions you want. But the book talk is going to be saved for tonight, if that's okay with everybody. Without further ado, floor is yours. All right. Uh, thanks for having me here. I, uh, as Jim mentioned, I uh, got a master's degree at Columbia at a school of public affairs, just like the LBJ school. Um, and uh, it was a great experience. I uh, it really I uh, made uh, friends and connections there that, that served me well to this day. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this is an example of that. I, I, one of the professors I had when I was at Columbia was Figu Brzezinski, uh, who uh, gave me a blurb for my book. So even 25 years later, that can be very helpful for me. Uh, and uh, I uh, learned a lot from people like Brzezinski that really have helped me as a journalist. Um, I, uh, the, I had told Jim that I had always thought my, uh, if I ever wrote an autobiography, I would title it, Waiting for People to Lie to Me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, it, it, maybe that's a bit cynical, but it, you know, a lot of what you do as a reporter when you're covering public policy is you stand outside closed doors and you wait for people to come out and tell you what happened. And they never really want to tell you what happened. Because usually what happened inside, behind those closed doors, is not favorable to their interests, uh, or it's, it's messy and complicated. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because I wanted to spend some time to actually try to find out what went on behind closed doors with Secretary of State Rice and with President Bush as they met with foreign leaders or they met with their staff. Try to figure out how do they deal with the very difficult problems that they face and that the country faces. Now, as a reporter, I have spent most of my time uh, writing about public policy. Uh, I have I started out covering Wall Street, uh, and in fact, I at one point was an editor of a, of a magazine uh, that dealt with Wall Street. And when I was the editor, I, I gave reporters my reporters two basic rules covering Wall Street. Rule number one was they all lie. Rule number two was, uh, it's much worse than we think it is. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you could, without being totally cynical about it, you could apply those rules that I have to covering politics and also to covering public policy. It's not that, not that people, you know, intentionally go out to lie. It's just that they want to present the, their view of the situation the best way possible that advances their interests. As a reporter, you're in somewhat in conflict with that because you want to write what actually happened. You want to try to get as close to the truth as you can. And sometimes, for reasons of national security, it's not advantageous to the, for the government to let the truth out at that moment. I mean, there's a reason why uh, the, public, the private communications of the Secretary of State and the President are kept classified for 25 years. They do want the passage of time, but to take place before some of those secrets are revealed. My job is to try to get it to the newspaper tomorrow. So there's a conflict there. Um, 
and I have, uh, over my 25 years as a journalist, I have, uh, in addition to covering uh, Wall Street, I also wrote for a number of years on airline safety, which meant I had to cover the Transportation Department and the Federal Aviation Administration. I tried to write about how safety rules were not being implemented properly, or how federal officials were involved in fraud, and they had to go to jail because of that. Uh, I covered Congress. I covered the Treasury Department, uh, the Tre Treasury Secretary, Economic Policy. I, I was a White House correspondent, so I covered the White House. And then finally now I covered the State Department. So in, all, in many ways, covering all of those institutions was very similar. Um, because there were things going on behind those closed doors that I wanted to let my readers know about. I'll give one, I'll give a couple of examples. There's a, there's a very interesting situation that just took place last month involving Israel, where uh, in the middle of the night, Israeli planes attacked Syria and destroyed what appears to have been a uh, nuclear facility that was being developed in cooperation with North Korea some sort of North Korean assistance. And it was in everyone's interest, North Korea's interest, Israel's interest, Syria's interest, and the interest of the United States, that no one knew this happened. No one wanted to talk about it. And ordinarily, as a reporter, I mean, this all started even before the, the uh, Israeli raid, I got a tip from a source who said, we have just acquired intelligence that uh, North Korea is helping Syria build a nuclear reactor. My first initial instinct on this was, this is the craziest thing I ever heard of. I, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Right now, the North Korea is about to sign a, uh, or is in the process of implementing an agreement with the United States and five other countries where they would shut down their nuclear programs. Why would North Korea be doing this? Why would Syria, which never really had much of a nuclear program, be doing this. So I knocked on doors around Washington, and so did some of my colleagues. Like, well, we have this strange tip. It doesn't make any sense. And, the, and ordinarily, the way it works in Washington is uh, someone will say, well, uh, you know, I'll wave you off that. Or, You're going in the right direction, but I can't talk about it. Instead, I got a complete blank wall. We're not talking about that. Not at all. I'm not going to tell you a word about that. And then, I suddenly saw that there were these weird reports out of the Middle East that Israel had attacked something in Syria, but Syria was not coming and Israel was not coming, commenting. And the, the most restrictive censorship in 30 years on the Israeli press had just been imposed. They couldn't write about it, do anything about it. The only country in the world that had commented on this situation was North Korea, <laughs> which had condemned it. Even though North Korea normally never comments on nuclear, on, on any international event at all. It was a strangest mystery. And ultimately, I was able to get enough confirmation that I could write a story that said, um, North Korea appears to be assisting Syria on a nuclear program, uh, but no one will talk about it. And, and we then got enough, and we felt not quite comfortable enough to even put that on the front page. And then we eventually got enough confirmation where we were able to put a front page story that said Israel had provided the United States with evidence that um, uh, North Korea was involved with a nuclear program in Syria. But, uh, and the initial instinct of the Bush administration was, oh my God, we can't do anything about this because this is going to screw up our deal with North Korea, which is why we want to keep it quiet. Um, and now over the weekend, one of my competitors in the New York Times actually advanced a little further to say it looked like they had destroyed a partially built nuclear reactor. Uh, I was never able to get a sense as to what kind of nuclear program it was. So there you kind of see, bit by bit, the story slowly coming out. And you should know that I was roundly condemned by many people in the non-proliferation community for writing the first story because they said, doesn't make sense. Can't be true. This is just, you know, some John Bolton fantasy that has uh, <laughs> made its way into the press. Um, but, you know, this is an example of where it was in no one's interest for the story to come out. Not the Bush administration, which ordinarily would have seized on any example of North Korean yeah. company. But in this case, they, you know, 
they see the chance of enhancing their legacy in some way, and there's this deal with North Korea. So it was very inconvenient. Um, uh, but as a reporter, it's my job to try to write about these things as they happen, as soon as possible, in ways that enhances the public's understanding about what is happening behind those closed doors. Anyway, I hope that's enough of an introduction. I'll be happy to talk, ask, answer any questions you have. Fair enough. Actually, let me sort of push it, use the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question, which is you paint a, a picture of yourself in conflict with administrations, uh, presumably when you were covering the Hill, uh, members of Congress, when you were covering the Transportation Department, members of the executive branch, you were trying to get information from people. Uh, but isn't sometimes they were <coughs> eager to give you information? Now, it may not be 100% of the story, but it's these important ingredients of the story. Obviously, in the run-up to the Iraq War, sort of looking back, a lot of criticism uh, that journalists at the Washington Post, New York Times, and other places were too eager uh, to listen to what the administration was, was saying to them. And so how, how do we make sense of sort of reporters' duty? Because it's clearly, in some cases, No, uh, you're not getting, I'm sorry, I guess the favorite word is spun, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, or being used to sort of transmit a story. All the books on bureaucratic politics talk about the strategic art of leaking, giving information to journalists to sink somebody else's uh, initiatives and what have you. So how, how do you make sense of that part of uh, the job? Right, what did I, I... <laughs> uh, Excuse me, I have to answer the door. <laughs> no, that, that's a very good question. I mean, obviously, Hi. Um, Thanks. Hi. We're so sorry. <laughs> uh, obviously, there, there is a there is a very symbiotic, symbiotic relationship uh, between reporters and any administration. And I mean, I think to some extent, the notion of you know leaks is is a bit overblown. I mean, it doesn't really quite happen that way. I mean, there are obviously going to be I mean, when you're covering the White House, the, uh, you know. The occasional, you know, phone call the night before where they're going to, you know, tell either the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, some some little tidbit or some announcement the president will make the next day, and it actually took the Bush administration some time to figure out that's the way it worked. You know, if you want to, you get more publicity for your initiative if it's given a, a day ahead of time to a particular newspaper than if it's just announced by the president. You know, everyone likes to have a little bit of a scoop. And the Clinton people were actually very adept. They loved to go to the USA Today because they realized that you got that big headline in all the airports. <laughs> you know, President to announce, you know, you know, new phone call, phone code for emergencies. I mean, they would put that on the front page and get a little bump out of it. Uh, but that's that's less of a, that's kind of minor grade leaking. And it's not really leaking, it's just kind of product placement. Um, the, the, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I started in, in Washington actually working for a newspaper called Newsday. And it was, it was really interesting for me to go from Newsday, which was a, you know, mid-sized, you know, top ten newspaper, but not widely read in Washington, to... Newsday's from, in, on Long Island. Right. For people who aren't familiar with Northeast media publications. That's right. And uh, going to the Washington Post. So at Newsday, you really have to work hard to get information, get people to talk yeah. to you. Uh, you know, going to the post, you know, you can get someone lazy about the level of access you have. Uh, it didn't, I mean, I didn't change as a reporter, I was the same person, but when I was, uh, there was one guy in the Clinton White House who never returned my calls for, you know, if my months of trying. And then the week I showed up at the Washington Post, he called me, invited me over to visit him at the White House, and then wouldn't let me leave. I spent like two hours there, stuck. And I finally said, I gotta go home to have dinner with my kids. And he just kept wanting to talk to me, tell me stuff. Now, didn't change. It's just as I suddenly worked at the Washington Post as opposed to years ago. Um, you know, in terms of, of, so the administration wants to get information out. And you as a reporter have to be able to discern what is spin, what is the truth, and it can be sometimes difficult. When I was covering the, the uh, White House, 
I uh, uh, found myself occasionally in a situation, I, I came covering the White House from covering economic policy, so I really knew things about the budget. And I would sit there and listen to Mike McCurry brief the press, and I was just thinking, God, oh, that's ridiculous. What a, what, what a lie that is. Oh, God, I can't believe he's spinning. I mean, just thinking it's all the way through. <laughs> And then he'd be talking about you know Middle East peace talks. I'd be mean, thinking, well, that sounds pretty reasonable, logical. And I'd have to kick myself and think, no, it's just the same guy kind of spinning you the same way. And now you have to like find out what's really going on. Uh, and it can be difficult. And you know, there's a lot of bad <coughs> journalism practice just uh, based on you know misinformation, mis mis mishandling. You know, uh, Paul Wolfowitz once described to me how. You know, was when he was a State Department official uh, many, many administrations ago, he used to dread speaking to the State Department reporters because they really knew the subject and and they would really challenge him. And he used to love and go brief the White House reporters because the you know, White House, you know, it's very difficult. One day you're writing about welfare reform, the next day it's something else. You know, he would he would say to the White House press, or you know, Japan is a nation of islands, and they'd all write it down. You know. <laughs> Questions. Yeah, we'll start in the back and work our way forward. And if you could introduce yourself to uh, Glenn, that would be great. Hi, um, Luther. I'm a first year student here at LBJ, and I'm from Croatia. Oh, okay. Which is not an island nation. It's not. <laughs> we have a lot of islands. Uh, Beautiful ones. Uh, my question is: So far in your career, what was the toughest story for you to get, and what are you most proud of? Uh, it's like asking me to pick my favorite child. Uh, you know, the, the, the most difficult story, um, you know, they, they all blur. I mean, I've written thousands of them. But One the, of the most yeah, right, you know, That's not right. Well, I mean, the, the, you know, the, yeah, the different ways, of, there's things that stick out. I mean, one, one when I was, um, there were a couple stories I wrote when I covered airline safety where I felt that I was actually helping save people's lives. There was a, you know, I did a five month investigation about the safety of foreign airlines. This was prompted because there was an Avianca jet that crashed on Long Island. And uh, with a colleague, we did one of the very first examples of the computer assisted reporting, this was in 1990, where we rank, ended up ranking the safety of every Air, foreign airline that flew into the United States. And it prompted the, the uh, FAA to actually begin regular inspections of the aviation authorities of foreign airlines and to begin banning certain foreign airlines from flying to the United States. And that was the result of, you know, they wouldn't have done it if we hadn't written this long series of articles about not only the safety of these different foreign airlines, but how poorly the FAA was going about examining the safety of those airlines. Because their previous uh, stance was any airline that flies to the United States is equally safe. And we demonstrated, no, there were huge differences between an Avianca and a Swiss Air. Uh, another air story I did, which was the result of a tip, it wasn't a leak, but just someone calling me from the FAA saying, we need to look into this, was that there was a particular jet that was highly susceptible to um, crashing crashing if there were small bits of ice on the wings, the size of salt grains. And yet they had never really trained pilots to recognize this problem. And so planes were crashing, people were dying, and they always blamed the pilots. Pilots screwed up, they didn't notice the ice. But it turns out this particular jet, it was a DC-9, was more susceptible to icing issues. The kind of icing that another jet you could kind of shrug off, but this one was uh, different. And because of that, they changed, uh, because of my article, they changed the rules for uh, training on DC-9 jets. Uh, and then one favorite article I had, uh, which was not you know, a big investigative thing, but it had to do with um, Bill Clinton. He, when he was president, early in as president, he had a haircut on, uh, at LAX airport uh, by a guy named Kristoff. Charge two hundred dollars a haircut, and he became a huge. You know, you think of what was a scandal at the time. 
but it became a huge deal because it appeared that Bill Clinton, man of the people, was having his hair cut by some fancy, fancy uh, hair salon guy, and poor, ordinary Americans, their planes were flying around the sky, and they couldn't land, and flights were delayed, it was a disaster, and that's how it was portrayed in the media. So just for the hell of it, I filed a FOIA request with the FAA to find out um, what actually happened. And it turned out there were no flights delayed, there were no <coughs> disruptions. Uh, you know, I interviewed the air controllers, I talked with all the airlines, there was nothing. And the FAA records showed no flight delays. It, you know, Bill Clinton had personally apologized to the American people. <laughs> 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 And you know, and then I wrote the story, and he kind of had to apologize for apologizing. So I can show you how the you know the media can create this image that didn't exist. And I was able to uh, puncture that myth. Hi, my name is Anita Sakova, and I'm from Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a two-part question. Uh, first is uh, how did you get from uh, public politics world to being a reporter? How did you make such a Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, I, I, it's funny. I always knew I wanted to be a reporter. From fifth grade, I wanted to be a reporter. I, I, I uh, printed up a little neighborhood newsletter, which I called the Cincinnati Fact. <laughs> and I was the only editor and reporter and publisher of this thing. Uh, and, 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 and then I, I, I kind of um, decided that since journalism was going to be my life, when I was in college, I didn't do, really participate in the campus newspaper or anything because I could do other things because I would be a reporter when I was um, uh, after college. And then I decided what I really wanted to do was write about foreign affairs, so I should get a master's degree in foreign affairs. Um, and it, did st it struck me midway through graduate school that God, now how am I going to get a job as a journalist if I have no clips, <laughs> no nothing? <laughs> you know, I don't. You know, you, I don't. You don't think of these things when you're in college. I was having such a good time uh, and doing other things besides journalism. That um, I. It was the early '80s, and I started looking around for, you know, where were there job opportunities in journalism? And it, what I noticed was that suddenly business journalism was really hot. And um, uh, the um, uh, you know the New York Times was expanding its business section. The business magazines were a big deal. So I thought, well, maybe I could get hired as a as a business journalist and use that expertise to then get hired by a larger newspaper. And so I took some courses at the Columbia was very good about allowing you to take even though I was at the International Affairs School, I could take courses at the Journalism School. I could take courses at the business school. So suddenly I just added a bunch of courses in business in business to learn about business so I could be a business reporter. And um, I got hired uh, right out of graduate school working for a, a small newsletter called the Wall Street Letter, which was kind of like the daily bugle. It was a weekly publication, but the, you know, the, the tip sheet on Wall Street. And you had to kind of beat the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and uh, my little hunch paid off because after a few years of doing this, I was then hired by Newsday to cover Wall Street. And as soon as I got that job, I was agitating to do other things, work my way down to Washington to cover politics, and ultimately, 20 years later, got to cover the thing I wanted to cover, which was foreign affairs. Uh, in terms of needing an expertise, I think it's, it's essential to be a good reporter, um, the, you know, you can't, you know, what a large part of what you do as a reporter is to try to take complicated subjects and explain it to people so that they can understand it. In order to write a thing about things simply, you have to have incredible knowledge. Uh, and I, I wrote this book um, in the hopes that it would appeal not only to foreign policy specialists but also to general readers 
people that just want to find out what has happened over the last seven years. And so I tried to write it in a way that, you know, even my mother could understand it. And, but in order to do that, I really had to get really deep in the subject matter about, you know, nuclear policy towards India, you know, nuclear policy of Iran, North Korea, Iraq. Uh, you can't write about, you, you know, you know, I find that if I don't know much about a subject, I just start writing in jargon because I just kind of am repeating the things that people said to me as opposed to really having a core understanding of it. If I may put a plug in for Glenn's book, I think one of the things that makes it exceptionally good read, and I'd recommend to anybody who's at a school of policy who hopes to go into government, is as you tell the sort of different stories of North Korea um, and other issues that the administration has faced, it's a very good primer on the way bureaucratic politics operates and the different kinds of stratagems that different people in the bureaucracy use to advance their interests. Because uh, unlike how you're, you know, how government's described to you in fifth grade, everybody coming together to make things happen uh, in a bureaucracy, people have different interests, different goals, and they spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to get around obstacles and go or go over obstacles to get things done. And I mean, I enjoy it immensely because it is tremendously good at giving you uh, an idea of how people get things done in the bureaucracy. And regardless of whether, if, even if you never end up working in the State Department, many of those same stratagems uh, come in very handy, uh, working for the Texas state government or a university bureaucracy. Uh, there's some sort of universality of bureaucratic politics. So, Jill. Um, well, <clears throat> there were maybe a couple instances like that um, where, you know, the Post is very good about listening to, uh, you know, the, the concerns of senior officials. I mean, there, there's a, it, this was not one of my stories, but one of my colleagues, uh, this, actually she won a Pulitzer for this, she wrote a series of stories having to do with the existence of secret CIA prisons that were located in, in Eastern Europe and other, well, I think it was mostly Eastern Europe, in European countries that um, uh, were used to question, some would allege torture, uh, al-Qaeda suspects. And in that case, the, the President of the United States, uh, George W. Bush brought the executive editor of the Post over to the White House for a discussion about these stories before they appeared. And at the president's request, um, the, uh, the Post did not disclose the names of those countries. We knew where those prisons were, but we've never disclosed where those prisons were located, uh, you know, at, at the president's request. Couldn't get us to not print it. I mean, it would have been in, if it were President Bush's, you know, option, he would not have us print at all about this. But he couldn't do that. And, of course, at that point, you realize you have reasonably good confirmation your story is correct <laughs> when the president <laughs> is saying, well, you know, just don't name the countries. Um, you know, in, in, um, in the one instance I recall um, where I had a request in the, you know, and again, we went up the line, the, the National Security Council, there was a story I had about how the um, U.S. military was about to uh, go against a, uh, there was a, it's very complicated, but there was a, there was a group known as the uh, Mujahideen al Kok, which was an anti-Iranian uh, group designated as a terrorist organization by the United States. They operated out of Iraq, and there was a huge bureaucratic fight within the Bush administration as to what to do with this, these guys. Some people argued they were a terrorist group, uh, which should be, should be treated as a terrorist group. Other people, particularly in the Pentagon, argued, no, these can be the vanguard for our operation against the Iranians. Um, so it had to do with not only policy towards Iran, but what do you do with a terror group? 
are they our friends or are they, you know, our enemy? And so I had gotten a, a sense that the, that the decision had been uh, reached to actually move against this group, which had little camps on the border between Iraq and Iran. And at the request of the White House, uh, we held the story a day so that um, my story would appear on the web as they were attacking this group. They didn't want me to write about the fact that the army was about to clamp down on this group. So, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it was a question of American lives. You know, I'm not going to why tip off these, this group. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, a lot of these national security questions, I think, can be somewhat overblown. And so there have been other times, I forget when, precisely, where we've just said, look, you know, you've made your case, forget about it, we're going to run the story anyway. Tanvi. Um, Tanvi Milano, PhD student here. Um, I have a question about, one hears a lot of uh, at least uh, rhetoric or people mentioning that this administration is better at information control. Uh, and I was wondering whether you thought that was true or that it's, it's just something that gets blown out of proportion as well. And you mentioned FOIA requests, and I was just wondering, do you feel like the process to get agencies to respond has become harder over time? Is it deliberate, or if, if you think it is slower, um, is it deliberate, or is it just a result of that flaw? Um, those are both good, both good questions. Uh, in terms of this administration, yes, uh, it is much more difficult to get um, information out of this, this administration. It less so now that it's in its waning days and everyone is desperately trying to say how, uh, you know, it would, things would be better if they were in charge. But certainly in the beginning, uh, I, found, I found that I, as a, as a White House reporter for a mid-level newspaper at Newsday, I had better access to the Clinton administration than I would have as a top reporter for the Washington Post covering the Bush administration. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, at the, you know, if, if I were uh, covering Clinton, I could call anyone on the National Security Council staff and have them answer my questions. And they were, you know, they were eager to, to help and try to explain things. Whereas, you know, it was, you know, working for the Washington Post, trying to talk to someone on the National Security Council staff required endless negotiation, discussion, you know, it, there had to be a media person on board, on the phone, monitoring the phone call, and you never got any information. It was, it was and I, I felt, frankly, that it was to the Bush administration's detriment that they didn't try to explain what they were doing. It wasn't like I was the enemy or anything. I just wanted to understand what was going on. And if I had a better understanding and a better access to um, what was happening, it would probably reflect better in my articles. I wouldn't have to go to outside people who would, might be critical or not. It was, I, mean, I think it was, in some ways, the, the, the effort to control the flow of information ended up backfiring. Uh, there was um, uh, one uh, person who I love to cover uh, was the former Deputy Secretary of State, Robert Zellick, who worked for Rice. His approach was the complete polar opposite. He would go into a meeting um, and uh, have a discussion, and he'd walk out of the meeting and he'd say, all right, and he'd just read through his notes, and say, this is what happened. I said this, they said that. And his feeling was, if you guys really know what's happening, you're not going to try to guess and you're not going to screw it up. And I was with him on one trip uh, where, uh, and I, I think it reflected in the coverage that Zelik got, that it, you know, because you didn't try to manage the news. On one trip, we were flying into Fallujah, and uh, I started quoting to him from some statistics I'd pulled out about, you know, the water supply was bad and this was happening and uh, all negative. And he, and he looked at me and said, well, that's very different from the information I have from the State Department. And he went back to the back of the plane. He came back and says, well, the State Department tells me 90 percent of the water is flowing and 80 percent of these things is operating. I said, all right, fine. So we go to Fallujah and he decides on the spur of the moment, he's meeting with the city council of Fallujah, he says, well, look, have the reporters come in and listen to this discussion. More ordinarily, we're in the, behind the closed doors, but he has us sit there. And, uh, 
And then in the middle of the discussion, he says, so, he turns to the head of the city council, State Department tells me that 90% of the water is flowing. The guy says, are you kidding? It's ridiculous. Nothing's working. You guys put in pipes. It was disaster. And water's not, it's all un undrinkable. And so anyway, afterwards, you know, so we all write these stories. And Zealot gets an earful in Iraq. I said to him, I said, why did you do that? Why did you invite us in there? And he said, well, you know, it was really bugging me. I didn't know the answer. I didn't know whether the State Department was right or you were right. So I figured if those reporters were there, what questions would they ask? And I figured I'd ask the questions that were on your mind. Then I'd find out the answer. We could try to fix it. And he said it was, it was better to get the message out to the president, to everyone back there, that things are still screwed up in Fallujah because he'd read it in the Washington Post. So, you know, very different kind of, you know, you know management style to the news. But, you know, Zellick got a, more of a break from the reporters, probably, that he was willing to be o kind of open and, and accessible. And, you know, and maybe it did get the water problem resolved in Fallujah, whereas the ordinary approach would be, we're going to just say everything's fine. And then ultimately, to get a reporter, a reporter would eventually find out. That's the thing. You can't keep the truth out forever. Uh, now, in terms of FOIA, uh, yes, it's gotten much more difficult. It was always difficult. I, I, when I was doing those FOIA requests on uh, foreign airlines, um, I, uh, you know, for 10 years, I kept getting responses from the FAA. In response, I mean, I, I mean, I'm long past the beat and what have you. I'd still be getting documents in the mail. It was, it was ridiculous. Uh, my favorite example of, of how FOIA could work is I once called a, a guy on this foreign airlines thing. I once called a guy and I said, can you help me on this? And he said, no, I can't. All your answers are sitting here in my files, but I'm not permitted to talk to you about it at all. However, if you made a FOIA request, who knows what would happen? <laughs> so I immediately wrote a FOIA request. I said, I hereby request the entire con file continents contents of this particular official regarding this particular issue. And two weeks later, I mean, he must have gotten across his desk. <laughs> Xerox had sent it out. Two weeks later, I got his entire file contents, and I got a very good story out of it. So it's, sometimes it can work. I, you know, that was under the Bush 1 administration, Bush 41. So I don't know. I don't know how it would happen today. Could you do a – oh, sorry. Go ahead. being part of the interior workings of the press was any discussion about how much information should be released or whether or not the administration should be critiqued or what kind of commentary the press had a responsibility to make after the government and then the administration's choices. Was there any discussion around that? Well, um, let's see. Um, I think that, um, I mean, it's not like it's a, it's a, it's a you know, I mean, I know that there were complaints about about access, uh, you know, at the highest levels, uh, and it has, you know, gotten somewhat better as the administration has gone on. Uh, in terms of the, you know, is the the press complicit? I mean, I think that you know, Jim had raised this before the question about, you know, the lead up, lead up to the war against Iraq, you know, and did the U.S. did the U.S. press buy too much of the of the information that the administration was putting out on on um, uh, possible weapons of mass destruction. I mean, I would argue that the record of the of the press is actually much better than the myth is about this, uh, and certainly at the Washington Post. Um, we, uh, with the day that Colin Powell made his presentation to the UN, we had, uh, you know, a main article, and then we had two full pages where we assessed critically every bit of evidence that he presented. And if you go back and look at what we said were the holes in that evidence, it stands up very well. But, you know, the, the, I don't know how they – I don't really watch TV. I, mean, I have one 14-inch TV, and I never look at it. So I don't know actually how – You want me to lend you one? I have like seven or eight. So. <laughs> I have three children. I mean, it's good to have one tiny TV that no one wants to look at. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, but, you know, I don't know how the electronic media 
covered it. And maybe they did it uncritically. And that's, I guess, to some extent, far more impact than the Washington Post might have. You know, where the Post has been faulted is we had a very diligent reporter, a legendary national security reporter named Walter Pincus, who wrote a number of highly skeptical articles uh, about the quality intelligence before the war. And those, most of those articles did not end up on the front page. Mm -hmm. And the editors had some reluctance about, I mean, the, you know, the editors want, didn't want to get in an argument with the President of the United States. And so those articles appeared, but they appeared on page 10 where they wouldn't have the impact. And, and it's, you know, it's, you can uh, uh, fault those editorial choices or not, but there was a reluctance to have that kind of public dispute. Uh, you know, on, on the other hand, I did write an article that ran three months before the war started where I laid out in pretty extensive detail that there had never really been a meeting discussed you know, on the pros and cons of whether to attack Iraq. And, you know, it took a long time to write that article and to actually be able to have enough evidence to prove it. But, you know, that on its face, I think, is, is, was rather surprising to find that, you know, the President and his advisors had never really had that discussion. Can I just push a little bit on this, Glenn? Wasn't it the case that the Washington Post editors after the war reviewed their coverage and were somewhat critical of their own decisions. And so I know the New York Times did a sort of post-mortem on, I believe, uh, Judith Miller's coverage. Uh, didn't the, the Post do something similar? No, there was a um, – uh, the Post media reporter mm -hmm. okay. wrote a story. Um, there was no real formal Washington Post review of such. And, I, and, and you know, I, I – um, uh, I mean, the one – you know, I, I'm trying to remember that article. I think that article may have been somewhat critical, and I don't, I don't know if it was fair or not. I mean, the one instance that I have which was, shows a bit of the mindset then is that uh, uh, about – I mean, I didn't cover intelligence, but about a week or two, about two weeks before the war started, I had a conversation with a very good source of mine who was a very uh, senior official. And he was very frank with me. He said, you know, I have looked at all the intelligence. I've seen all the intelligence. And I'm increasingly afraid we're not going to find anything there. Uh, we're not going to find any weapons of mass destruction. It was kind of a shocking thing for him to say. Uh, and I said, what? And we went through it, you know, and he just said, you know, there's, it's just, it's too fuzzy. I mean, now that I've looked at it, I've reviewed it, and I've, you know, been involved with it, I'm really scared that we're not going to find anything there. So I took this conversation to my editors who um, – and eventually part of it ended up in a story. Uh, but their initial response was, oh, my goodness, they're already spinning you for, you know, what might happen if they don't find it. Mm -hmm. And I actually argued back. I said, no, this is a, this is a good story. This is not someone that tries to spin me. He's just being very honest and open about this in a way that I hadn't heard people talk about this before. And they didn't believe me. They felt, oh, it's just, this is a spin. And that's how those comments ended up being used, you know, an editor inserted, you know, in, in an effort to try to okay. – so. challenging in terms of getting uh, stories out there uh, for you personally, but more in general, is there much talk about what one often hears, read in the middle section, that subscriber uh, subscriptions are going down or stalling? Does it actually affect your day-to-day -day job or, and what you're expected to cover? Uh, well, certainly the web has, has changed things a lot. Um, there's more interest. I mean, it used to be when I you know, started in the newspaper business, there was one article that would, I would write, and it would appear in the next day's paper, and I'd have all day to work on it. And you find during the course of a day, you're not quite understanding, you didn't quite understand it at the beginning of the day, you know, your knowledge base gets better. 
uh, there's much more uh, of an effort to try to get news on the website quickly to match with the 24-hour news channels and what have you. And so that means that the stories are not fully reported and you have a higher possibility of not getting it right. Uh, I also, uh, you know, if I travel with the Secretary of State, I have to produce a blog. You know, it's called On the Plane, which is, you know, and I find that I write more for the blog than I do for the newspaper. So it's like double the work. But it's giving, you know, anecdotes and incidents and things, life, it, what, is, what is life traveling with the Secretary of State um, that doesn't appear in the newspaper? Um, you know, and one of my colleagues at the Travel with Rice and had to bring along a video camera and put together a little video <laughs> blog, too. Uh, and for a while there, we had a Washington Post radio station. I had to go on the radio station and, and talk, you know, talk about the story on the radio, too. So it means there's less time to actually report out the story and, and get it as, as good as you could possibly want it. Um, and I do think that you know, we've, we've run the risk of, of um, you know, uh, there's such demand for instant reaction and instant impact that you have the news media really shaping the news. We're putting the White House on the spot to immediately comment on something in ways that they were never expected to before. Uh, I do think that the value added that, that I add as someone working at the Post is that uh, I do a lot more analytical stories, uh, a lot more explanatory stories. There's an extra level of, of, of context that you can provide that you're not going to get on a television uh, and uh, you're not going to get elsewhere. And that's really, I mean, one of the things I, I, I love doing is, is um, and I think I was one of the first people to do this in an extensive way, these kind of truth squad stories, where you, you know, during a presidential debate or after a presidential speech, you immediately try to figure out, well, they threw out lots of facts. Were these facts accurate? What are the basis of these facts? And um, it, um, you know, readers just love these things because I think people are confused. They hear the president say something and they wonder, is this correct? What is the context? Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I think that's that's a value added that that now you see a lot of newspapers doing uh, in news organizations, and I think there's a, a hunger for it. Let me ask one final question. Most of us are never going to have the privilege of traveling with the Secretary of State around the globe. Just give us some taste of what it's like. Uh, you know, if you if you want to get a sense of what the sort of day to day grind is like when the Secretary goes to Israel or goes to Iraq or goes to Russia or wherever else. Um, well, it's um, it's glamorous and it's not. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's. Uh, Do you want a trench coat, by the way? What? <laughs> foreign corporals wear trench coats. Uh, yeah. Well, I used to have a real beat up one that one source used to call my hit my Colombo coat. Okay. Particularly because I was always saying one final question. <laughs> um, the um, uh, no, it's you know, it, I've covered the both the White House and the State Department and. Uh, Traveling with the president is very different from traveling with the Secretary of State as a reporter. Uh, presidential travel involves, uh, you know, 300 or so reporters who travel on a separate plane. There's a small pool that will rotate in and out on Air Force One. But you, and you almost never see the president except on television. It's kind of, a, it's kind of like a phony, it's a, it's a really phony form of journalism covering the president overseas because you know, you have the dateline. It could say, you know, Naples, Italy, or Berlin, Germany, or Beijing, China. But you're never, you could have covered a thing from, you know, Washington. There's a small pool. You write up a pool report. Everyone borrows from that pool report. Uh, there's an infamous story about the first President Bush who uh, was uh, criticized in the New York Times for misunderstanding the supermarket scanner. And that was taken from a pool report, and the New York Times reporter got the story wrong. I mean, he was the president was not seen, not a clueless man, uh, you know, clueless of the of the life of the ordinary American. He was actually seeing a really super neat scanner that hadn't been used before. But it was became this myth. Yeah. It was all based on a pool report. 
with this, if you're with traveling with the Secretary of State, you're on the same plane as her or him. You're in close quarters with the staff. Uh, you mingle together, and you get a you get instant feedback in your stories. I mean, Secretary Rice will come back to me if I write a particularly tough one and say, "Well, gee, Glenn, what made you so cynical today?" Uh, I mean, she's generally very good natured about negative stories, uh, and um, you don't go through uh, passport control or anything like that. You get on these vans. You never see your passport. You never see a security monitor. You never see a line. You're in the bubble. And you uh, follow her around wherever she goes. Uh, sometimes it can me make for a lot of traveling for f small news events. Like if you, if like right now she's in Israel shuttling around. So today, and she went to Egypt. So I'll tell you what the reporters had to do. They had to get up this morning in Jerusalem, drive the 45 minutes to the airport in near Tel Aviv, get on the plane, fly the hour to Cairo, get in vans, go to uh, the foreign ministry, and sit there, wait outside for the hour or two hours that she's in meeting with the foreign minister, and then they will come out and have a news conference. Now, this will probably be a good news conference because the foreign minister is kind of a crazy guy who says all sorts of crazy things and loves to bash Americans. And there will be two questions from each side. The American journalists will rot rotate among themselves, deciding who would ask the question that day. And then we all would sit around and come up with the best possible question to put the Secretary of State on the spot to generate news. So it's a group question. You know, so-and-so the New York Times might ask it, but it's really, it's really a question formed together by a group. And it's an interesting process, because you're trying to get the Secretary of State, particularly this one, off her message, off her game plan, get her to say something provocative or interesting that creates a story that will get you on the front page the next day. And she knows that. It's a great little game we play. Uh, and then there you are. You've asked, you've had your 20-minute news conference, and it's going to be back on the vans, driving through Cairo, you know, note every, all the traffic held for you, get back on the plane, fly back to Tel Aviv, get back on the vans, go 45 minutes to your filing center in Jerusalem. And you will have done uh, five hours of shuttling around and travel for one 20-minute news conference, uh, which sometimes could result in a front-page story if you really got her to say something interesting. Um, but on the other hand, when sometimes when she's off in her closeted rooms, mm -hmm. I'm touring Tiananmen Square or Red Square or seeing the world. I've probably been to 60 or 70 countries with secretaries of state. And so I've seen a lot of the globe. I uh, tell my wife that I'm picking out future vacation spots. <laughs> <laughs> what are the contenders right now for best vacation spots? Well, you know, we, uh, in my, um, uh, well, we, we do this lifetime too. So I took my kids uh, to Borneo this past summer, which I didn't go to with the secretary of state. And last year we took them to Vietnam. Uh, so, which was terrific. It was a wonderful vacation. Uh, I think we're thinking of India for this coming summer, which I've only seen New Delhi, but uh, I want to see more. Well, if you want people to go with you, I'm sure we can get volunteers from the audience. <laughs> uh, Glenn, I want to thank you for a, a terrific set of remarks, and everybody join me in thanking Glenn. My final words would be, when you're in government, be nice to the reporters. <laughs> we don't bite. And the full reporters could be your friend. Very good.